Well, if you'll take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, we're going to be in chapter 5, verses 23 and 24 this morning as we continue our study of the book of First Thessalonians. And as you're turning there, it was about a year ago that Jeffrey Zacks, who is a professor of psychology and radiology at Washington University in St. Louis, he lamented about a global trend that he was observing and that it, uh, it's, it's a trend that looks for shortcuts for the solving of our problems. He said, is it just me or is everybody out there looking for a quick fix? There is something highly compelling about the idea that there is a secret switch that we can flip to become suddenly smarter, to reveal cognitive abilities hidden inside each of us. It is a notion that certainly has commercial appeal, over the last seven years, the games maker, Lumosity, rocketed from zero to 50 million users promising rapid improvements in general intelligence by playing brain training video games for just a few weeks. It's interesting that Lumosity recently had to settle with the United States Federal Trade Commission for making unsupported claims that its product was scientifically validated. Memory health, nutritional supplements, they have sales of more than $1.5 billion a year, and smart drugs, pills to enhance our cognitive performance, have become prevalent on college campuses. Purveyors of products based on subliminal messages promise to teach us foreign languages or cure our addictions while we sleep, and makers of headgear that attaches electrodes to our scalps promise to rev up our brains to improve gaming performance and other cognitive abilities, and I have even seen some of those that attach to your scalp promising rapid hair growth. No, I have not bought any. As much as this is true about our cognitive or health benefits, it is equally true when it comes to our spiritual growth, our sanctification. There are many believers who are looking for a shortcut to holiness, to sanctification. We don't want to hear that sanctification is a lifelong process and that it is occasionally painful. We want to hear that there is a quick verse or Bible study that we can uh, do and become instantly holy. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to hear that sanctification is not a one-time event like our salvation, like our justification is. We want to hear that once we're saved, we're good. We can just continue going on without any change or without any, any work on our part. But the entirety of Scripture all of it points to the fact that sanctification is a process in our lives. It's something that takes time, and we're going to spend the rest of the time that God gives us here on earth growing in our spiritual maturity, in our holiness, and being shaped and conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. The Thessalonians, just like believers in every time and place, they were facing these same challenges, and it is this process of sanctification in their lives that Paul is praying for here near the end of this first letter to the church at Thessalonica. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word as we read these two verses that constitutes Paul's gospel prayer here at the end of this letter he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together as the body, that we can come together and worship you through our songs, through our prayers, and also through the study of your word. Father, I pray that as we look at this prayer that Paul has for the Thessalonians, that we see in our own lives the need for growing sanctification, for growing holiness. Just as we sang this morning, holiness is what we need. Father, I pray that as we study this passage, we see how we can become more holy thanks to the work that you do in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Now, in Paul's letters, it is not unusual to find him praying for those to whom he is writing. And, and we see this here at the end of 1 Thessalonians as well. Uh, we see in the beginning of these two verses Paul's uh, prayer for the Thessalonian sanctification. You know, sometimes we forget just how costly it was for someone to write a letter in Paul's day. It was not an easy process. The materials, the, the materials to write on, you know, today we run down to Walmart and we can pick up a whole package of notebook paper for a quarter, right? But that wasn't the case in Paul's day. It was very expensive to get these parchments and these animal skins that letters were composed on. The ink was expensive. And here's another thing, there wasn't a post office in Rome. If you wanted to send a letter, you had to hire somebody to be a courier for you, and that entailed a lot of travel costs, right? Not just the amount that they needed to travel, but food, lodging, all of these kind of expenses for you to send a letter. So sending a letter to somebody meant that you really, really cared for them. And Paul is demonstrating how much he cared for the Thessalonians by lifting them up in prayer because he understood just how important prayer is and just how powerful it is in our life. So he's lifting up. This, these two verses, it's a short prayer, and it just gives us a glimpse of how much Paul loved the Thessalonian believers and how much he wanted to lift them up to the Father. Now, sanctification, we're talking about this. This is one of those big church words that we toss around sometimes like we expect everybody to know what it means. The reality is, brothers and sisters, we're living in a growing post-Christian world. We're growing in a world where we have second and third generation unchurched people. That means not only are they not going to church, their parents didn't go to church, and their grandparents didn't go to church. They are far removed from the language of the church. Now, I'm not suggesting that we jettison the language of Scripture. Sanctification is a word in Scripture. Justification, it's a word in Scripture. We need to hold on to these, but we need to take greater care in explaining what these mean, uh, letting people know what sanctification means, what justification means. So with that being said, let's talk about that. To sanctify something means to set it apart. That's what the word means, set it apart. And in the Old Testament, we saw things being sanctified in the tabernacle and in the temple, things like altars and candelabras and tables and dishes and even curtains, things that were set apart for the worship of God. That was what it meant to sanctify something. You were being set apart for a religious purpose. Well, in the lives of believers, we are also to be set apart for service to the Lord. Now, this is not the exclusive area of those who have been called to vocational ministry. I'm talking about people like pastors, okay? All of us, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, you have been set apart to serve him. You have been set apart for his service. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, every single believer has a God-ordained purpose for their life. And not only do you have a God-ordained purpose, it was prepared for you beforehand, which means that God had that purpose for your life not only before you were saved, but before you were born, and even before the creation of the earth, as we see in Ephesians 1. There was a God-ordained purpose for you. But in order for you to be used by God, you need to be set apart. You need to be sanctified by him for the purpose for which he has created you. You know, it's interesting that in the Greek, the original language of Scripture of the New Testament, in, in the Greek, the word for holiness and the word for sanctification are almost identical. They are the same word. It's just a variation on it. And so what we need to understand is not only have we been set apart, but we also need to understand that our sanctification is the process, 
that produces the result of holiness. That's what happens. Sanctification is the process. Holiness is the result. That's what we're getting at. That's why the words are so similar in the Greek. When we speak of God being holy, it means to be separate. It means to be unique. It means to be wholly different from everything else. And when you think about God, that's who he is, isn't it? He is not like us. He is not like anything in all of creation. God is bigger. He's greater. He's more wonderful. He is great and holy. And he's called us to be holy as well. You know, we sing songs that say there are none like him. And Scripture says that too, right? There are none like him. That's why the sin of idolatry is so terrible, because we're taking something that we have created and we're substituting it for the one who was not created, who was always, who is the great I am. Remember, that's how he described himself to Moses on Mount Sinai in the burning bush. He said, I am that I am. God has always existed. He is not a created being. And his desire is for his people to be separate from this world as well. His desire is for us to be separate from sin, to be unique, to be holy just as he is holy. And we see that principle running through the Old Testament. We see it running through the New Testament. It is a principle that is always in place. And we must go through the process of sanctification in order to reach holiness. We have to have our sin burned away. I love, I love that great old hymn, How Firm a Foundation, Ye saints of the Lord. You, you probably know it. I'm gonna, I, listen to the fourth verse from that song. I'm not going to sing it. I want to. But I'm not going to be a stumbling block for you this morning. I'm, the, the, the fourth verse of How Firm a Foundation says, When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. You see, when you want to purify a metal, you have to heat it up. You have to put it in the fire. And what happens in that process is the metal melts and all the impurities in that metal rise to the surface, creates a kind of a scum surface that's called dross. And you can easily skim it right off and have just the pure metal left. You see, when we go through these trials in life, that's what's happening. We're having those impurities burned off of us, the dross to be consumed by God. And as those sinful desires and actions are removed in the process of sanctification, the end result is holiness. And, and when we get to our last point this morning, we'll examine the processes that God employs to bring about our sanctification. Now that we have a better understanding of what that is, I want you to see who is ultimately at work in our sanctification, it is God himself. God is at work. It is, that's what Paul is praying for. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. That's what he's saying. The God of peace himself. Now in the, in the verse just, just prior to our passage, verse 22, we saw this last week. Paul said, abstain from every form of evil. Abstain. You know, in one sense, you and I have a responsibility for abstaining from evil, just as we saw. We have a responsibility to avoid sin, to run from it, to flee from it, just like Joseph did when he ran out of Potiphar's house. That's what we have a responsibility to do. But I would venture a guess here this morning that every one of you sitting out there knows of a time when you tried to resist temptation in your own power and in your own ability, and you failed miserably. You gave in. You sinned against God. You did these things. And it illustrates the point that this is 
God at work in us to empower us to resist temptation. This is another aspect of God's great and saving grace for us, is that he is the one who is at work in us to sanctify us completely, to make us holy. And he accomplishes this through the finished work of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, what he accomplished there for us in the atonement, and through the work of the Holy Spirit and, and God's word. It's amazing grace that saves a wretch like you and me, but it doesn't just save us, it sanctifies us as well. Uh, consider the second verse of how firm a foundation. He, the, the author of that hymn said, Fear not, I am with you. O be not dismayed, for I am your God and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. That's how we stand, brothers and sisters. It is not of your own ability. It is of God's ability working in you. That's how it works. But I don't want you to overlook how Paul describes God in this passage because it is the foundation of how we can have that power. He says that God is the God of peace. He's the God of peace. Now, I want you to think for just a moment here. Before you were saved, before you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, the Bible says that you were at war with God. It says that you were an enemy of God, and that as a result of your being an enemy of God, you were also children of his wrath. That's who we are. But it is through the atonement of Christ, the work that he's accomplished on the cross, that we can have peace with him. And listen, God is the God of peace. Yes, he's the God of justice, and, and he's a God of holiness, and he's a God of wrath, and he's going to hold us to certain standards, absolutely. But he is the God of peace. And that is evidence no more than it is in Jesus Christ. Because while you and I were yet sinners, while we were still enemies of God, while we were still children of wrath, he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me to pay the price that you and I could not for our sin. That is amazing grace right there. That is a beautiful display of how he is the God of peace. But I have to tell you this morning that if you are apart from God, if you do not know him as your Savior, there can be no sanctification in your life. There can be no holiness in your life apart from Jesus Christ in you. It is impossible you cannot save yourself by any good works, and you cannot sanctify yourself by any good works apart from what Christ has completed on the cross. Now, while those of us who were saved by God's grace have the blessing of his sanctifying work in us, we know all too well that this is a process that takes time. It takes time, sanctification. And there are moments when we slip and when we fall and when we're tempted and we give in and we wonder sometimes, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it to holiness? Am I going to make it to sanctification? Well, let me give you a word of encouragement, brothers and sisters, from the Word of God this morning. You will, your sanctification will be complete in Jesus Christ. It will be. Why? Because he is faithful. Our sanctification will be complete. Listen, when Paul asks the Lord to sanctify these Thessalonian believers, he's not asking this as if God won't do it. He's not asking it as if God might do it or he might not do it. He's asking because he knows God will do it. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6 of that book. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. And then to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 12 of his second letter, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. You see, God is going to make sure that this is it. Be encouraged, 
that the good work that God began in you when he saved you will be completed on the day that Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. Now, as we saw just a few moments ago, sanctification is the process. Holiness is the result. And it's the second half of verse 23 where we see Paul praying for that result in the lives of the Thessalonians. He says, And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is not the first time that Paul has prayed for this for the Thessalonians in this book. Back in in chapter 3, verse 13, he prayed that God would establish their hearts blameless in holiness. Now, just as it is impossible for you to be sanctified apart from a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, so it is impossible for you to be blameless before God apart from our holiness. To be blameless is to be holy. That's what it's talking about here. When sin gets into the life of a believer, it weakens us. You all know this. You've all been through those seasons where you have struggled with that sin that seems to cling so tightly, as the author of Hebrews says, that sin that besets us. You know what that's like. We're weakened. But it is not that God leaves us or forsakes us during this time. He's promised that he never will. Listen, just because you slip and, and fall, it doesn't mean that you're in danger of losing your salvation. Praise God. I am so thankful that every time I sin, I'm not having to wonder, is God fed up with me, and he's going to take my salvation away from me because of something I did. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you could lose your salvation, you would. You would do it when you slept. You wouldn't even have to be awake for it. I would lose it five times during this sermon, probably. It's possible if if it were just up to us, but praise God, our salvation from start to finish is the work of God alone. It is not us. It is not anyone else. It is God alone. But do not hear this as being a justification for you to go out and sin more. Just because you can't lose your salvation doesn't mean, okay, well, I've got my uh, irrevocable fire insurance. I can go live however I want. That's not what your salvation is for. Your salvation, as we've seen, is for you to do the good works that God has prepared beforehand for you. That's what it is. And we need to be growing in our holiness, growing in our sanctification. We need to understand this. Those whom he saves, he sanctifies and makes holy. And this holiness and this blamelessness, it's not limited to our spiritual state only. Our holiness is to permeate all aspects of our body. That's why Paul writes here and he says that he wants the the Thessalonians to be sanctified in, in all aspects of who they are, in their spirit, in their soul, in their body. He uses that language to indicate the completeness of a human being, that there's no part of your body, no part of your being that is left untouched by Jesus Christ when he saves you. Our holiness extends to all parts of us. Now, there's some questions sometimes. People come to this verse and they see This language that Paul uses, this this idea of whole spirit and soul and body, and they wonder, well, how is the human composed? Is is the human being composed of three parts, or is it just two parts, uh, spirit and body? Uh, And and Scripture is, it can be a little confusing, because sometimes Scripture uses spirit and soul interchangeably. And sometimes, like here and in Hebrews 4, where it talks about the the Word of God being sharper than any two-edged sword that can separate spirit from soul, uh, sometimes it it seems to indicate maybe there's some difference. So let's, let's investigate this for just a moment. Spirit in the Greek is a word that is called pneuma, pneuma, and pneuma meant spirit, wind, or breath. We translate it as spirit, wind, or breath. And in the idea of Scripture and the idea of of the ancient Greeks, your spirit was that immaterial part of you that could respond to God. That's the part that has interaction with God. And whether you believe there's three parts or two parts to a person, 
Everybody agrees this is the part of us that can communicate to God, can hear from God. And in all of creation, humans are unique because they're the only ones with a spirit like this. We have been made in the image of God. Animals don't have this. Animals don't have spirits like this. No matter what all the memes on Facebook suggest, that you have a spirit animal and all this. No, 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 no. The, we are the only ones in creation that can do this. And the spirit that we have is the result of God breathing life into us when he created us out of the dirt of the earth. But the second word, soul, this word is psyche in the Greek. And it often carried the connotation of our inner thoughts, our inner ideas, uh, our, our heart, if you will. And, and the idea of the soul is also an immaterial portion of us, but this would seem to be a component that was also useful in animals. You, you can see animals have thoughts, right? Uh, if, if you've got a dog, you know that that dog's thoughts are, oh boy, my owner's home. It's so exciting. I'm so glad to see you. And if you have a cat, it's, hmm, I wonder how you would taste uh, today, right? I mean, that's kind of the difference between dogs and cats, isn't it? Uh, but, but you see, the soul is something that connects all of us. It's part of us. It's, it's, animals have it, humans have it, and that's it. But again, in Scripture, the distinction between pneuma and psyche isn't always clear-cut. It isn't always uh, distinct. Sometimes they're used interchangeably with one another. But finally, the word body, that's soma in the Greek. And this one's easy. It's this. It's muscle and sinew and uh, tendons and internal organs and all that. That's what the soma is, the body. It's the flesh. It's what we have here. It's the physical aspect of us. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe humans are, have three parts, spirit, soul, body, or if you believe they've got two parts, a spirit, soul, and a body. That doesn't matter because what Paul is talking about here is that there is no part of you, no part of you, that is untouched by sanctification. All of it is. Your physical body needs to be sanctified. Your spiritual body needs to be sanctified. It all needs to be done. He wants the Thessalonians to grow in their spiritual maturity. And they, he knew that this meant how they interacted with God. It, it meant how they interacted with one another. It, it meant how they thought and how they felt. And it meant how they acted. Every part of it. There's no distinction between outward holiness and inward holiness. You, listen, you can't be being sanctified internally, growing closer to God, and not be being sanctified externally and grow closer to the world. Those two things are incompatible. You can't do it. You can't be growing outwardly sanctified and inwardly rotting. It's, it's, it, you've got to have both going on. It's impossible for us to grow closer to God in our spiritual being and grow farther apart from him in our physical being. Both are necessary. And this is why Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then listen to verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. But you see, unfortunately, we've missed the balance in this. We've missed the balance so often in, in this. It strikes right to the heart of what Paul is saying here in his message to the Thessalonians in terms of both their holiness and their hope. On the one side, we see that it is by God's power alone that the church even exists. That's it. Listen, the church could not exist if it were not for the power of God. It is impossible. And do you know why? Because the church is composed of sinful human beings. Each one of us here is sinful. I remember Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher, once said, if you should ever find a perfect church, run away from it as quickly as you can, for if you join it, you will ruin it. <laughs> 
And that is true. That is true. It's true for every one of us. We all are sinful, but it is by the power of God that the church is held together. And what's more, for the church to be found blameless at Christ's return requires God's power to keep her blameless. Because we all know just how blameless we would be if we were left up to our own devices, wouldn't we? If we were left up to our own power, we would not be blameless at all. But on the other side, we have seen how each believer has a personal and a corporate responsibility within the body of the church to be willing to yield their lives to God's sanctification. We have to be willing to let God renew our minds daily. We need to be willing to sacrifice our bodies daily as a spiritual sacrifice to God that he finds pleasing. We need to yield ourselves to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's why Paul exhorts and he admonishes so much the way that he does. We often get this balance out of whack. We're either swinging in one direction thinking that we can just be passive participants in our purification and that we can just sit here and be sanctified like we're at a spa day with God. Or we swing the other side and we think that it's all by everything that you and I do that we achieve our sanctification, that we've got to work harder, we've got to do more, we've got to be more in order for God to accept us. No, it's not either or. You see, the work is being done by completely. It's being done completely by God, but he works in the hearts of those who surrender to him. That's how it works. So is it any wonder that Paul would conclude this short prayer with a declaration of God's faithfulness towards his people? Look at verse 24. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. That is amazing. That's, that's a blessed assurance, brothers and sisters. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Do not miss the amazing nature of what Paul is telling the Thessalonians here because their thoughts are not all that different from our thoughts sometimes. We've already seen how the Thessalonians were very concerned about those who had passed on from this life. They were worried about what happened to them and we saw how Paul gave them hope. But we also know that the Thessalonians must have been concerned that maybe when Jesus came back, they would not be sanctified enough for him. And Paul is saying, don't worry. God is faithful. He will surely do it. It is by him that this will happen. So if that's ever crossed your mind, if you've ever wondered, am I going to be good enough? Am I really going to be sanctified enough? Then listen to Paul's encouraging assurance again. God will sanctify those whom he calls. It's not a may. It's not a might. It's not if you do enough to meet him halfway. God will sanctify those whom he calls. He is faithful and he will surely do it. There is no duplicity. There is no deception in God. He will surely do it. There is nothing that he says that he will not faithfully fulfill. He will do it. If you've been saved by Jesus Christ, you will be conformed into his image. It is impossible for you not to be. You will be now, you may feel, as Paul did, that you are the chief of sinners and that everything you do is wrong and that you fail more often than you succeed. And you may even be wondering this morning whether or not all your failures would cause God to look at you and say, I've had enough. I can't do it with this guy anymore or this girl anymore. If that's you this morning, I have something that you need to know, and it is this. All of your failures, all of your sins, God knew before he sent Jesus to the cross to die for you. Your sin tomorrow is not going to catch God off guard. It is not going to surprise him he already knew about that sin, and not only did he already know about it, he sent Jesus to pay the price for it. And it is paid in full, completely, utterly, 
That is it. And if God truly did love you so much that he sent his son to the cross for you even when you were his enemy, then rest assured that he is going to see the completion of that salvation in you. Your sin is not greater than your Savior. You need to understand that. But how does he do it? How does he work sanctification in us? Well, he does it through many different ways. There's many methods that God uses to sanctify us. I want us to take a look at some of those this morning. First of all, there's the Holy Spirit. Believer, do you understand what a great blessing it is to have the Holy Spirit in you? I think about the Old Testament for just a minute, because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit of God was active and he was at work, but we see that the people of the Old Testament, those Old Testament saints and believers, did not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come on them for a time and for a purpose, and then he would depart. We see it in Samson, right? Samson, that man of great strength, strongest man that ever lived, he would have the Spirit of God come on him. And when the Spirit of God was on him, he could kill thousands of Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. That's power. But we also see that the Spirit of God would depart from him because Samson also was a carnal man, and his sins would get the best of him, and the Spirit would depart. King Saul in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come upon Saul for certain purposes during his reign, and then the Spirit would depart from him. And at the end of his reign, the Spirit departed permanently. But all that changed on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus' ascension to heaven, and the helper that Jesus promised, the teacher, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, came upon the believers and has never left. And when you are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells you, and he helps to sanctify you. And he does this by making you feel convicted when you do wrong. When you do something wrong and you feel that tinge in your chest and you know that you shouldn't be doing it, that's the Holy Spirit working in you convicting you, showing you what is right and what is wrong, pointing you to what is right, and convicting you to abstain from what is evil and focus on what is good. That's the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Second, there's God's Word. You know, as we approach the 500th anniversary of the Reformation this year, October 31st is the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Church of Wittenberg Castle in Germany. It changed a whole lot because the Reformers started to put an emphasis back onto God's Word, and we have what's called sola scriptura, which means by Scripture alone. And this was an important thing. Now, in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to be studying that topic in more depth as we study the five solas of the Reformation leading up to uh, the anniversary. So suffice it for now to say it was important for Scripture to regain the ultimate place in the life of the church and in the life of her people. It had lessened somewhat through the Dark Ages, and it became Scripture as being uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, an authority, but it was not the only authority, and in fact, it wasn't even the highest authority. There was also tradition, and there was also the church, the magisterium of the church, the rulers of the church. They had as much, if not more, power than Scripture. And so it is that the Reformers said, no, Scripture alone is what should be our ultimate guide. Scripture alone is the measure of all things, not anything else. And it should be central in our lives. We need to read it devotionally. We need to study it. We need to memorize it. We need to meditate on it. We need to pray it. We need to apply it in our lives. We need to do all these things because, you see, the Word of God is living. It is living and you cannot come to the Word of God and experience it without being affected by it. Now, can I be honest again with you? I know this is two weeks in a row. I'm asking you to set aside all the church kind of stuff. And 
This is why I believe many believers do not spend more time in the Bible. It's because it is living, because it does confront our sin, because it does confront us where we are, and it calls for us to change. It calls for us to put more faith in Christ, to, to set aside those sins that we are enjoying, to set all of that apart, and to be sanctified. And that's something that can often be painful, and we don't want to do it. So we don't spend time in the Word because that is used by God to sanctify us. That's why the Reformers made the proclamation of the Word the central focus of the worship service of the church. It's because we must hear the Word proclaimed. We must hear it rightly divided, and we must hear it applied in our lives so that we can be sanctified by it, just as Jesus prayed in John 17 when he said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We have to be sanctified in the word. Third, there's also confession and repentance which provide forgiveness and cleansing. When we're confronted by those areas of sin in our life by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God, we need to repent of those sins. We need to confess those sins to God. Now listen, God's forgiveness is complete. When, when you are saved by Jesus Christ, all of your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. They're completely forgiven. But we also must continue to seek his forgiveness when we sin against him, even after salvation. It's not because we're not going to get his forgiveness. It's because when we confess our sins and when we repent from our sins, it changes us. It's part of the sanctification process. When we admit these things, when we tell them to one another, when we confess them to God, we remember what God said in 1 John that if we will confess our sins, God will be faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins, and we will be removed from our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so when we confess and when we turn away from our sin, we're demonstrating the power of the Spirit's sanctifying work in us. And then finally, God sanctifies us through the ministry of the church. It is impossible to read God's Word and come to the conclusion that you can be a believer apart from the church. You can't. You cannot be a believer apart from the church. That's like saying I'm married, but I, I don't live with my spouse. I don't hang out with my spouse. I don't do anything with my spouse. I do things with other people, but I never do anything with, with him or her. That makes as much sense, doesn't it? No, if you're a believer... God's plan was always the church. It's the body of Christ. And parts of the body do not live apart from the body as a whole. And God designed the church to be led by elders, which are also known as pastors and overseers in Scripture. Those three terms are used interchangeably with one another to refer to the same office. And, and Paul says that these elders and pastors... He tells Timothy that they have a duty to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Those of us who have been called to serve the church as elders, as pastors, we have a duty to help you in your sanctification. We have been called and equipped by God to do that. So when you hear an elder or a pastor preaching the hard parts of Scripture and not skipping over them, knowing that they're going to step on your toes. When they admonish you, when they rebuke you, when they exhort you, I want you to understand it is not because it's fun. It's not because it's what we necessarily want to do, but we have a duty to see you grow in your sanctification and grow stronger in your spiritual maturity. God will use many means, brothers and sisters, to sanctify you. Do not resent these methods. Do not resent his sanctification because he loves you so much. He doesn't want you to see, he doesn't want to see you just saved from your sins. He wants to see you cleansed from your sins as well. He wants you to be blameless as the bride of Christ when he comes on that day for her. Now,
Here's the problem. As believers, we're often less sanctified than we ought to be where we are in our spiritual walk. Remember when the author of Hebrews wrote to that body of believers, he said, by this point, you should be teachers, but I'm having to give you spiritual milk. We all should be a little further along in our walk, and that's me too, right? I'm not saying that to you specifically as this body of believers sitting in these chairs right now. I'm saying that generally. We all need to be a little farther along in our sanctification, but we allow those sins to beset us and to hold us back. I have a good friend who's a pastor over on the other side of the state, and I saw him make a comment uh, today, and I thought it was really, really powerful. He said, have you noticed how there's a lack of people following the evacuation instructions in the path of these storms, whether it was Harvey, whether it's Irma. They don't do it. He said, should we really be surprised when they don't listen to the evacuation when you've got reporters standing out in the rain saying, hey, everybody, you better go. It's really dangerous out here. Well, too dangerous for you, but not for me. And then we as believers are out there telling people, God's judgment is coming. It's coming on sin. You need to be made right with God. Don't be involved in these things, but I can be. It's okay. It's it's too dangerous for you, but it's not too dangerous for me. How in the world are we going to have people listen to us, brothers and sisters, if we are not pursuing sanctification in our own life? If we're not pursuing holiness in our own life, don't be surprised when people look at you and say, the only difference between you and me is you get up early on Sunday morning. We have to have holiness. We have to be pursuing holiness and sanctification in our lives. But brothers and sisters, the glorious thing, the wonderful thing about this is that it is God at work in us through Jesus Christ to bring about our sanctification. It's him working in us. It's not us doing more and more. It's us yielding more and more. And so this morning, if that's where you're struggling with with your growing holiness, with your growing sanctification, the altar is open. Come and pray. I'll pray with you down here. I'll be with you. I'll, I'll walk through this. We'll set up some time to talk and disciple and do all of those things. But again, I have to remind you, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, There's nothing you can do that can sanctify you. There's nothing you can do that will make you holy. You can only be made holy through the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So if you don't know him, if you don't have that relationship with him, I invite you to come down and talk to me. I'll be right down here after I pray and as the as the praise team sings our final our final hymn this morning. So let's let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your sanctification. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you not only saved us from our sin and the death that comes with it, but you're not content to leave us in our sin either. You desire to cleanse us of our sin, to make us holy, to make us sanctified and separate and clean. Father, Sometimes we rebel against that process. Sometimes we fight against it. I pray this morning that our hearts will be broken under the conviction of your Holy Spirit and that we will quit fighting against the sanctification you're trying to work in our lives and we would just yield to you and surrender to you so that your glory may be known to those around us and to the entire world that he could take a wretch like us, a sinner like us, And not only save us, but cleanse us and turn us into a beautiful and prized possession. Father, we pray that through that, you are glorified and that Jesus is proclaimed. We ask it in his name. Amen.